Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore the purpose of suffering. My guest is my dear old friend, Daryl Robert Schoon. He is the author of You Can't Always Get What You Want, Light in a Dark Place, The Time of the Vulture, Letter to the House Select Committee on Intelligence, Is God Confused and the Way to Heaven? He is also currently a minister in the Church of the Temple of Universality in Tucson, Arizona. Welcome again, Daryl. I have to congratulate you on your recitation of all of those books. Mm -hmm. I have to congratulate you on writing them. I think it was harder to remember them for myself than to write them. I wrote them <laughs> under duress in, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's Jeffrey. a pleasure to be with you again, Daryl. And, I, and I, what I wanted to say is this, is that I think I, there's an audience that you have brought to your channel that's rather rare, all right? And, and it's really specifically for myself, um, particularly meaningful because I am used to talking to no one. I mean, really. And I've told you this before about how at, at a certain point I wasn't talking to anybody. I had pulled in the manhole cover and I had shut it off and I wanted to get out of this country and go live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's before, that was in 1999 when we we're going to go and look, we get to Tucson and we're going to go somewhere else. All right. And, Obviously, it wasn't in my dharma, as many things aren't. My life is rather unintentional at one level, at the conscious level, much like my writing is, all right? In fact, on, on, we were going through the books on how those books got written and how they weren't intentional at all, in my sense, all right? I've written a number of books, clearly, and I've got another book proposal cooking right now. So if you were going to look at my life, or if I were going to look at my life, God forbid, I would say, oh, he's a writer, because I have written a number of books. But the first book that came through, you're familiar with. I think you're the only one of the few people who have actually read it. This is in 1994. I had just gotten out of prison, and I'm, 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 you know, I'd gotten out of prison a couple years before, and I'm sitting down, I have dinner, and I get, I get up, and I'm doing the dishes, and this image comes in my head from where images come from. And the image was the protagonist is working at a biological sciences laboratory, a stone on acid, and he's looking at a monkey in a cage. All right, this is the image that came to me. And the protagonist goes, wow, check out this monkey. And then the protagonist said, and then I heard those words that are as clear today as they were then. The monkey said, who do you think you are anyhow? At least I know I'm in a cage. All right, so these words came to me. I had no idea what they were, but I wrote them down. They were quite unusual. And I sat there, Jeffrey, and I looked at these words, 1994, and I go, what is this? I hope it's not a book. Now, why would I say that? Because I had, I figured that books were difficult, that they were a long slog. You had to do a lot of work on it. And I had enough troubles on my plate without now becoming an author. All right? It wasn't one of my list of to-dos. Mm -hmm. What happened is... I sat down a few nights later, I had a feeling, I had no plot, I had no nothing, and I started writing into the feeling. Chapter number one. Over the next six months, 34 chapters, equal length came out, the book wrote itself. Yep. All right? Now I'm with a book. What am I going to do with this book? And I knew that you were happening. You, were, you had a, 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 TV, a channel on PBS called Thinking Aloud. You had already, you were a successful author. You had written a book called Roots of Consciousness that made quite a splash in the publishing world, in the world of, 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 of books. Yep. It, was, it was a significant book. So I figured maybe you could help me. <laughs> so I get a hold of you. And we had already known each other we, since the early 70s. Since 1971, yeah. you came in my restaurant in Berkeley, my Chinese natural foods restaurant, 
and sat down and ate, yeah. which is ironic because tonight at your house in Albuquerque, I'm going to cook a Chinese dinner. Uh -huh. Okay? Yeah. And that's what we're going to do. I remember studying the art of cooking Chinese food from you back in the 70s. That's so our roots go way back. Yeah. Our roots of consciousness and you and I yes. are, are connecting. Mm -hmm. Okay? So here it was, night, and I, so I decided maybe you could help me get published. Yeah. And you came and you told me, I gave you my book, and I said, yeah, and Jeff, you go, you know, I, 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 he said, I don't read fiction, okay? Yeah. And, 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 I, and I, okay, I understood that. He said, but I'll take your book, all right? So I gave you my book. Now, what I want to tell the people watching this is the, sh the history of my book, You Can't Always Get What You Want, I had published it under the name Leonard Elmore. Now, why would I do that? Because I knew the odds about me getting published, a drug dealer writing about was not in the cultural zeitgeist, all right? So I thought maybe if I used the name of a known author, Elmore Leonard, flipped it around <laughs> to Leonard Elmore, I would get published. Mm. So I did it. I, I registered the book, published it, but I soon found out that I couldn't get an, uh, a distributor. They don't pick up books from unpublished authors. So I canceled everything. What happened is, is that when I started canceling the book, I went to my post office box and I found five orders from libraries around the United States for You Can't Always Get What You Want by um, Leonard Elmore. The reason is, Publishing Weekly had done a hatchet job of me. It had come through. They're the establishment magazine for the publishing industry. They get a book called You Can't Always Get What You Want by Leonard Elmore. They knew this was an Elmore Leonard. So what I think they did is they gave it to somebody to give it a negative review. The guy clearly liked my book. Because he quoted some of my best lines mm -hmm. before ending with the caveat, wait for the real thing. The, it got, it was right up there with books from Wiley, Random House, you know, <laughs> you can't always get you one by Bolinas Press, and five libraries wanted to order it. I knew this wasn't sufficient to have my friend put up t the money for a print run of 2,000 copies and have it be in his library. Mm -hmm. So I canceled it. Yep. One month later, we got a phone call. Is this Bellina's Press? Yes. Oh, God, more bad news. I said, we've got an order for your book. I go, really? Yeah, this is Books a Million in Indianapolis. Somebody wants to order it. Is, is, is this, you know, yeah, 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 it's us. I said, listen, I'm not sure if we're going to go to print. Could you ask the guy how he found out about the book? So she calls me back and she said, he said that he was standing in line in Japan at the PX. Somebody was raving about this book and he made a promise to himself as soon as he got back to the States, he would order it. And he did. I think it was your book that I gave you that got this. <laughs> because you had taken it to the Asia. Yeah, yeah, I had a long 10 hours on an airplane, and there was your book with me. <laughs> yes, and you told me later it made you so paranoid you couldn't go to sleep because <laughs> of the tension in my book. It, it was full of tension. Oh. It was about a big drug deal. Oh, it was full of tension with yeah. metaphysical overtones. Yes. Remember I wrote about the metaphysical overtones. I, yeah. I, taught, I ascribed something to... Um, to Fat Ed as the as a conductor of life, mm -hmm. which was fate. Mm -hmm. right? Because it was really the name of a barbecue house. I thought it was fate, fated, but it was really Fat Ed's. All right. Mm -hmm. So it had metaphysical overtones. All right. And you had read the book. Yeah. Well, that was my first book. All right. But how are we going to publish? You know, nobody's going to publish. So nobody did. The next book was. Um, um, it happened because Marshall, my friend from law school, Marshall Thurber, Thurber Marshall Thurber, yeah. interviewed in, entwines with my life like even today. And Marshall calls me up. He says, "Daryl, I want you to read a book. All right, it's not it's not available yet in the United States. But if you call Connie Kellogg, she's a publish she's the head of Namaste Publishing in Vancouver. She'll get you the book. So I call Connie up." And I said, Marshall, oh, she, oh, Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. I said, what's the book? She says, well, Marshall told me it's this, called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Okay? So I, she sends me a copy of the book. This book was not yet in print in the United States. She was his, 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 Eckhart's original publisher in Canada in 1999. I get the book, and I read it. Wow. Many of the things that Eckhart said in there reflected what I had written when I was in prison, in a seven-year prison from 85 to 92. During that time, and this is, we discussed this before yes. on one of our previous talks, mm -hmm. I started meditating 
seriously, mm -hmm. big time. In fact, one time Mar Marshall came by our house in Tucson and he said, Daryl, did you do weights in prison? Because Marshall's in the physics fitness. And I said, no. And he said, why not? And Martha answers, she goes, they're too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but I did meditate. Yeah. And I meditated with a passion that I never had before on the outside. Well, it's a good place for meditation. For me, it was the only place where I was going to do it like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I seriously meditated. And what happened, Jeffrey, was something I didn't expect. It. I got enlightened for a period of time. I was there. I was talking to it. And I knew it. Jeffrey, I knew it. All right? I knew it. I remember at, during this period of time, somebody called out to me, Hey, Shun, wake up. And this voice in my head said, I am awake. It is you who are still asleep. All right? That wasn't the conscious Daryl Shun. That was it. And I was talking with it. I was at one with it. I, I was in a state that I knew, Jeffrey, that people meditated, gave up meat, sex, cigarettes, their loved ones sit in the cave to get to. And I was there. And I was talking to it. And then it went away. Mm -hmm. All right? And then it went away. But I knew when I was there, I was there. And I had written down a few things when I was in that state. And one of them was very evocative of what Eckhart had written in his book, The Power of Now. Because Eckhart said, you, you should be in the now. This is where we all went now, where we are now. But he said, the reason why we're not in the now is because of our minds and our emotions. The minds pull us into the future, all right? And thinking about anything else, and our emotions pull us to the back. All right. One of the things I had written when I was in prison in that state was this. <clears throat> Will a future that never happens determine what we do today? Will a past that ever lingers be the reason why I feel this way? There was the power of now yeah. in two sentences. And I'd never shown these to other people. I really didn't. I hadn't even shown them to Martha. I, when I got out of prison, I don't go, you know, I was enlightened and here it was what? I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. They were sequestered away with all the rest of my writings. And, and in fact, I think it's fair to say that somebody like yourself, fresh out of prison, has a difficult time adjusting after seven years. And telling people that you've been enlightened there is not going to get you a, a cup of coffee yeah. or any agreement or anything. All right. And readjusting was quite an experience. All right. Which I have another metaphor. Readjusting from prison is just as much, is, is, is quite an experience just like readjusting from the illusion that we experience as reality to real reality. Because my, I'm saying, Jeffrey, with all the confidence of one who is in that Kirtle zeitgeist, that the reality that we think is real is pure illusion. People who have near-death experiences have the same issue. How do you talk about what nobody knows? I first encountered that experience as an acid hippie, all right? I took so much acid that, because it was the only thing that got me out of my mind. You know, and when I realized, when I got to that state in meditation, I realized the similarity. What the state in, in that oneness that you have, there's no judgment. There's no thought no. explained. You're just there. In that now, you're there. Yeah. And on acid, you're there. Yeah. But I had to take a lot of acid to get there, and then I had to meditate a lot to get there later. All right? So I know the similarities between those two states, and I know the differences in getting there, and I know that we all sort of at one level want to get there. But I want to tell you what the Course in Miracles said about that, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. um, I had gotten, you know, for people who hadn't seen the original talk with us about this, I had been, I was one of the first people, I make another metaphor, just like Dr. Mishlev, you were the, one of the first people ever to read uh, how, uh, You Can't Always Get What You Want by Leonard Elmore, or my <laughs> pen name. I was one of the first people to read The Course in Miracles. Hmm. Why? Because in 1976, Marshall and I, at the end of four years, had been doing affirmations starting in 1973, and we were both wealthy. Marshall, in 1970, we started out from a baseline where Marshall told me he was broke. I said, Marshall, you're broke in wingtip brogues 
<laughs> I'm broke in flip-flops. There's a difference. All right. Marshall then says, Daryl, you got to read this book I just got called The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. Marshall gets, I read the book, I'm stunned. It, it reminds me of Robert, Roberto Asigeli's The Act of Will. Okay. But otherwise, I'd see nothing like it. And it was what was going to become affirmations years later. So Marshall and I start with our own little list. Three years later, Marshall is living in a mansion in, in, in Presidio Heights next to Diane Feinstein with the Rolls Royce, the Corvette. I'm living in a rental on Union Street, which is a very nice street, with a Carmagia. And I've got more money. I mean, I'm rich. Mm -hmm. I've got a sh lot of cash. It came to me through drug dealing. Marshalls came to him through real estate. But when you do affirmations, you don't say how it comes. I just imagined myself rich, and I got rich through being a dealer. Marshall imagined himself being rich, and he started turning real estate like a... Well, he was going out of style in San Francisco. Well, we're going to come back and do a, a revisit of okay. our earlier interview with on affirmations because okay. there's a lot behind all of that. Okay. But so, now we'll focus on the thought of what brought me back there. Yeah. The Course in Miracles and about getting enlightened. Yes. So oh. around a year after I'm into the Course, I remember exactly where it was. I'm in Japan in an intercontinental hotel waiting to go into China. Now, this was quite a, ch a change in 1977, 78, because Japan was one of the most urbanized, advanced societies in the world. The bullet train. I mean, they had, they were so urbanized, the pollution was filthy in the area. The air was dangerous. China, <clears throat> people were still walking, riding bicycles, wearing blue coats, as Chairman Mao told them to do. There were oxen in the street. Oxen in the street. The only cars were taxis that were come from Eastern Europe, all right? And there were limousines from Russia, Zildjians. And I was about to go to the next day. And I'm, at, I'm on the Intercontinental Hotel in Japan reading The Course in Miracles. And it said this. Another backflash. Remember in 1979 when I got... You you introduced me. You tried to. You said, Daryl, I want to try and get you in this UC program called Health Information Project. Yes, it was but, a, but in seventy one. Seventy one. Yeah, and I got to admit it because I wrote a paper to the dean because it's the same word here, mm -hmm. and this is what it was. She, I told her, you know, here it was. It was a UC Berkeley project, yeah. and I had graduated from UC system. I'd gone to UC school, but I also gone to jail for selling LSD. Right. So I had to write a paper explaining why they would still want me in the program, and I said this. Everybody wants to be enlightened. The state that my mother calls happiness. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point that got me in Clever there. line. Clever line. That my mother, you know, she could uh -huh. refer to it. This lady, these poor kids, all their kids are taking acid. Well, I'm reading The Course in Miracles, 1978, which is seven years after you and I had been involved in the Hip House program. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reading The Course in Miracles, and it said this, the same word. If you're not happy, it is because you haven't asked to be happy. Because of who you truly are, if you would truly ask to be happy, you would be happy. There's that word. And so then the next words were, if you haven't truly asked to be happy, perhaps you should ask why. So I'm being led by the Course in Miracles on a th series of thoughts. Now, I didn't believe that. That if I had asked to be happy, I'd be happy. But the book had a lot of answers to questions I had never asked. Mm -hmm. So I remember, Jeffrey, I'm on, the, I think, 28th floor of the Intercontinental Hotel. Very fancy place. I closed the books and I closed my eyes and I said, why haven't I asked to be happy? Just like I did with Michael Tom's Knowing Seminar. Why haven't I asked to be happy? And I waited for the answer to come. It was immediate. The answer was, you're afraid of dying. And I knew exactly what it meant. It wasn't physical death. It was the ego death. Because my ego was afraid of dying, I was afraid of being enlightened or being happy. And Jeffrey, that took the wind out of my sails. I, ever since the hate ashbury 1966, 67, when I took acid, found this alternate reality, 
And I started reading every metaphysical book I could, ingesting as much acid as my body could take. I wanted to get there. So I identified as somebody on the path wanting to get there. Mm -hmm. And what this statement from The Course in Miracles told me, if the door to enlightenment were right over there, I'd be looking everywhere else. I would be pounding on the windows, trying to get out through the vents, trying to get through the wind, through the wall. But I would never go through the door because I was afraid of what it meant. That shocked me, Jeffrey. My self-identity went, Phew. all my meditation, all my becoming a vegetarian, all the things I had done in my life since 67, it said, if it was right in front of you, you would do it. Yeah. When I ended up in China the next day, I was blown out. I was really blown out. Because that statement just shocked me. And, it, and I was no more willing to go there then than I had been in the previous 12 years as a seeker. Mm -hmm. So another one I was looking for, I was afraid of getting. All right? So there I am in China, in a state of shock, doing business. And God provided again. The universe provided again. Because when I was over there, I had a tape from Jerry Garcia's band, and it was called The Wheel. And this is what the lyrics were. The big wheel turns, the you know, fire and brimstone, and it said, you can't hang on. You can't get off. But won't you go a little bit further than you've ever gone before? And it talked about suffering. Mm -hmm. How tough the, the wheels are of the Dharmic wheels. The wheel of life. The wheel of life. But it said, you can't get off. You can't stay on. But won't you go a little bit further than you've ever gone before? And Jeffrey, I want to say this. That those words were enough to get me back to the United States. Mm -hmm. <sighs> because it had it had blown me away so much that my searching was basically futile. I didn't, I was afraid to get to where I thought I was going. How do you get there then? Happiness, mm -hmm. suffering, enlightenment. Yeah. What do you do? And that was in the Course in Miracles. Okay, now, what the Course said later was about surrender, spiritual surrender. It says you can't do it. You can't surrender because you're too afraid. Your ego is going to hang on too much. You can't surrender. Not that you won't, but you can't volitionally. Mm -hmm. And it said, and God would not ask of you what you cannot do. God only asks what you can do. God would only ask that you're willing to be surrender, willing to surrender. And if you're willing to surrender, God will take this gift of you and give it back. So this is how I got to the surrendering part. <laughs> okay? Because the only way I got to enlighten that state was taking a whole lot of acid and circumventing my volition. Mm -hmm. My volition was couldn't get in the way when you took that hit of acid. Yep. Boom! And you're there. You're, oh, oh, you knew what the saints knew. You knew what everybody was trying to get to. And then you come back down. Back into your world. Yep. So, what happened was this. The volition. A few years later, after reading those words, okay, in the late seventies about surrender and oneness, I'm in Mill. I'm in Mill Valley. I started to do affirmations again, okay, because I ran into another book that explained it was all spiritual, all it came from God. Oh, I can do it again. So I, I go from being flat broke again to I'm stay. I'm living in a in a state in Mill Valley, forty five hundred a month. This is nineteen eighty three. I'm dealing drugs again. Life is good. I'm at the I'm I, I you know a year from starting again. I'm in a suite in, at the Hassler Hotel in Paris. I mean in in Rome. Yeah. All right, life is good. Mm -hmm. These things are working. Yeah. And then I'm reading a book. Thinking in Destiny, and it says, your use of thought to keep to keep adversity away is the inappropriate use of this power at this time. Because what you learn through is adversity. And you are suffering. You learn through suffering. And you are keeping suffering away from you through this use of thought and affirmation. Wow. I couldn't say it wasn't true. Because, of course, the miracles told me that. 
years before. And I knew, okay, so it was the second time around, mm -hmm. those magic words. So what, what I told me, oh God, what does this mean? Now let's just re repeat for a moment the, the uh, message from the Course in Miracles about you don't really know what you need. Exactly. 1976, I'm on my path. I've been on this path for 10 years of getting there. And the Course seemed to be the latest road sign, a road map. It seemed to be not only the latest, but really unusual. Re re redolent with more promise than anything I'd read in between. And I'd read a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah. But the Course in Miracles seemed to be even full of more promise of what Daryl Robert Shune wanted. Mm -hmm. So I'm really at it. Yeah. And I get to a lesson that says... You want certain things, and you don't want other things, all right? Why? Because based on your path, you've determined what you don't want and what you want. You don't want to suffer. You want to have the good life. And we can iterate that for our audience. Health, abundance, joy, presence, all these <laughs> Everybody, Everybody wants. wants okay? yes. Nobody, Nobody wants, wants suffering. suffering. <laughs> no one. <laughs> yeah. And this book, this is 1977. I'm reading. 76. I'm reading these words. Yeah. I'm one of the first people to read the Course of Miracles because of Marshall. Mm -hmm. He'd given him the money. One of the four people gave him the money to publish the first copy. So I'm reading these books, and I see that this is what it says. And then it says, "So you don't know what's good or bad for you." Some of the things you enjoyed the most have retarded your progress. Other things, you've been the, the ones that have been the most difficult and you suffered the most, you've learned the most from. Yeah. You told me a story last night, Jeffrey, about this friend of yours. Yes. And you said, well, before he got burned in a horrible motorcycle accident where the gas lit him on fire and made him horribly disfigured. And that was me. And then Janelle turned to you and said, that was before he got paralyzed. Yes. <laughs> I go, <laughs> Who is this guy? W. Mitchell. All right. Yeah. And I said, how do you know him? And he said, oh, he goes around all the world telling the story. And he says, he says that if he had to do it all over again, he would. Yes. And I said, you know what? That's like my time in prison. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have agreed on the front end, but after I got out, if I had to do it again, I would in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. All right. But the universe never tells you up front what it's going to be. They just get an ascent at some other level because they know the answer would always be, I don't want to be paralyzed. I don't want to be disfigured. I don't want to go to prison. Yeah. And we all get there eventually in this lifetime or another if we want to, if we choose to. Because of who we are, if we truly ask to be happy, we would be, as the Course says. But I had to go through my fear of ego death. I had to go through my attachment to my mind. One of the things I wrote in prison was this. I think. I'm trying to remember it. Because I never thought of it again until just now. To enter the portal, you go without thought, without judgment, without memory, without anything except the cloak of Christ. Without your piety, without who you think you are. You go naked into the presence of God, clothed only in the cloak of Christ. Okay? So you have to leave at the door all your judgments, all your memories of who you are, all that stuff. It doesn't mean you can't come back and get them, but to go through that door, you gotta let it go. And letting all that stuff go is our identity. And what the Course told me, you are so attached to your identity, you're not, you're afraid to get in the door. And that's what it hit me. Holy shit. I'm not gonna open the door even if it said enlightenment right here with a sign on it. Bip, 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 five seconds, four, three, two, one. Ah! I wouldn't open it. Yeah. And when I realized that, it shocked me, Jeffrey, because my, I had self-identified as a seeker, as somebody serious. I mean, I read, I meditated, I gave up meat for a while. I did all these things. And this tells me that I was too afraid to go through. Mm -hmm. So there I am, a few years later, sitting in Mill Valley, doing affirmation again, life is good, I'm living in a place, in a state in Mill Valley, 4500 a month, I got money, but, you know, I'm sitting there, and then I read that book, Thinking of Destiny, he says, your use of thought to keep away adversity is keeping away the situations you need to learn from, which is the subtopic of our talk, the purpose of suffering, learning through adversity, 
which is another word for suffering, difficulty. Mm -hmm. All right? So when I read those words, I knew they were true because of everything else I had read. All right? And I thought, wow, here it is again, Daryl. But because of the way my life is, things could happen to me. I could go to jail for the rest of my life if they'd known what I was doing or what I had done. All right? So I said, okay, I'll just stop doing affirmations. Two years later, the biggest bust of my life comes down. Ten-year prison sentence. I'm in prison, and I'm meditating like there's no tomorrow, which is a great turn of phrase, isn't it? Meditating like there's no tomorrow, because that means you that's your entry into the now. Yeah. Meditating like there's no tomorrow got me to the present, and I got there. So what happened is, when I wrote those words down, I didn't show them to anybody when I got out. I didn't even show them to Martha. Look at Martha. Look what I wrote when I was enlightened. One of the other things I wrote, believing myself temporal led to my fear of the eternal. There's another one for you. All right? From a battle hardened <laughs> to, a, one, to a stream joined all. I had a series of things that I read, that I wrote in the print. Hadn't shown to anybody. So after I sent them to Marshall, Marshall, Marshall says, you got to write a book. So I sent these things to Marshall. Marshall said, send them to Connie. Connie said, and she asked for permission to distribute these sayings of mine at Eckhart's, Eckhart Tolle's event in Vancouver. All right? So that was the second book. Mm -hmm. The third book I write is on economics. Because I had gotten a, as you call it, a download. I mean, words from it about the time of the vulture. The time of the vulture. An economic collapse that was going to have no precedent. All right? The time of the vulture... That in, t in times of contract, in times of expansion, it is to the hair the price goes. In times of contraction, it is to the tortoise. S slow and sure is preferable to the quick and easy. In times of contraction, there comes a time, however, when neither the hare nor the tortoise is the victor. This is the time of the vulture. The vulture feeds neither upon the stored up wealth of the bear, or the pastures of the bull, which lay buried beneath the rubble of economic collapse. Instead, the vulture feeds upon the blind denial and ignorance of the ostrich. Mm -hmm. The time of the vulture is at hand. I heard those words, Jeffrey, in 1991, in my last year in prison. Mm -hmm. Led to my writing, my study of economics, led to my writing and predicting an economic collapse in 2007. I wrote about it. We put it up on the web. It got ordered in 22 countries. My reputation and, and I'm under, under the impression that those words are still very meaningful. We're not out of the time of the vulture. We're going deeper, deeper into it. it. Yeah. What happened in 2008 was like the heart attack that sends the guy to the hospital. He doesn't get out. He's still in intensive care. You think this economy is good? I know. I, I mean, I, like we talked about the repo markets. Yeah. In 19, in 2008, Eight, in that previous crisis, the feds poured $1.3 billion trillion. Trillion, into the repo markets to keep it cool yeah. for six months. Six months. Mm -hmm. They didn't put another penny into the repo markets until September 17th, 2019. They're still putting money in. And to date, to the middle of February, they had already they had put in $6.6 trillion. $6.6 trillion compared to $1.3 trillion before. So I know the patient is still in intensive care. They try and pull him off of intensive care by normalizing the interest rates. Every time they do it, the stock market collapse, the patient goes into fibrillation, but the lines go up, the red lines go up, and they all rush in, and everybody's freaked out, all the investors are freaked out, and the doctors go, the nurse comes up, the patient's doing well. He's in a state of recovery. Don't worry. You know, we're going to lower the interest rates. And all the people in the, in the waiting room, oh, they're going to lower the interest rates. We're going to make more money. And the stocks go up. That is what has happened the last 10 years. We're skating on thin ice. I want to tell you something. I always thought that's a great thing because my metaphor about enlightenment is this. Jesus tells us to walk on water. And we go, we can't walk on water! And then he says, look, you've been walking on water all your life. You just don't know it. You think that's solid. This is an illusion, you fools! This isn't real! And you guys are going out there and act like as if, and your belief that it's real keeps it real. You have been believing and projecting 
a belief reality that isn't real at all. You are deep in illusion. But because of who you are, the illusion has substance, depth, time, space, everything. But it isn't real. So when I tell you, you're going to walk away, you can. You just don't know it. You're afraid to. You'd rather stay in your illusion of fear, loss, everything, than do what I told you to do. Trust. Trust. And we were afraid to do it. You know what it is, Jeffrey? Just came to me. Okay, he's given us the time to do what he told us to do. You know what's going to happen? We're going to get shoved up, shoved off the... <laughs> we're going to get pushed. There's a lot of suffering in our future. There's a lot of suffering in our future. But what I want to say is this. In fact, what's really funny is when we met up again last night, because I haven't seen you since October 31st, yeah. okay? when we did the series of talks. Yes. And I, came, and I said, you know, Jeffrey, I've never felt better in my life. Yeah. I've never felt more confident. You were more yeah. pessimistic then than you are now. Okay. Now, what has changed? What, and you could. What's the difference? <laughs> Terrible. What's the difference? I mean, you were pretty dark then. Yeah. So now you're saying you feel really good. Mm -hmm. Well, the and I said, my answer was coronavirus, basically. Why? One of my sayings, Jeffrey, is this. God taught me to dance by shooting at my feet. <laughs> and I don't have a natural sense of rhythm. So it took a lot of... Okay? Mm -hmm. And you keep the gun going long enough, you start to levitate. So that's my lesson through adversity. That's another way, mm -hmm. learning through adversity. God shooting at your feet. Mm -hmm. right? Not a particularly graceful way to learn, but I can just test you it's successful at a certain level. For you. For me. For me. Yeah. I don't, I don't recommend this to anybody else. I think in my dharmic path, I chose to do it before I got here. I mean, I think you're, we're fortunate when we're able to learn from adversity. Oh, totally. I, I used to be a bit of, you know, I, you know, I've used the I Ching all these years. Mm -hmm. All these years, okay? And I remember being in prison. No, it was when I got out. And, you know, I know what the good life is. <laughs> I mean, I do. In fact, I've said, I know I've had the good life enough that I know what overindulgence brings. Okay? I've eaten in restaurants in Paris, everywhere. I've eaten in the three duck, I ate at a sick duck restaurant, which is the Peking duck restaurant of the hospital. I Because they had names for them back in the 70s. The famous Peking, I was there in the 70s in Peking, Beijing. So I've had this life. I've had presidential invitations. You know, I was the only one in the room, I think, with a with a rented tuxedo, <laughs> but you couldn't tell. All right, in back in Washington D.C. So I've had this life. All right, but it's been particularly difficult at times. All right, and but I've learned the most from it. And you're lucky when you can say that. And I say that because, I, like a ton of every the United States is a police state. I mean, we're not a police state. You know who's saying that? The people never been in prison. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. If that doesn't qualify the police, I want to know what does. Mm -hmm. All right? This is a country that sent all these people to jail for drugs in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and now drugs are legal. Pot's great. We're investigating LSD. Everybody right. was on board. I've heard they just legalized psychedelic mushrooms. Absolutely. Everybody. Yeah. We were eating up until they couldn't go out of style. And that's why so many of us ended up in jail. Yep. Yeah. All right. Erkman told a, a reporter in 1996, he said, you know what? He said the Nixon White House had two enemies, the anti-war hippies and the civil rights Negroes. He said, you can't throw hippies in jail for being hippies or Negroes in jail for being new. You can't, but you've you got to have another reason. You know, he said, but you can throw them for, in for drugs. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And that's... You know, the origin of the war the on drugs. The origin of the war on drugs. And now yeah. it's a baby and everybody's, oh, everything's cold. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so I've had this life, but it's given, it's given me insights that I never would have had had I not been on that life. Yeah. All right. So that's, so I wrote, this is how I, I write. So anyway, let's get back to those books. So we, the course of the, 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 uh, the time of the vulture, where I predict an imminent economic crisis. And Jeffrey, life is good to me. Because after I read those words in 1991, after they came to me, and after I studied, started studying economics, and I had a lot of help along the way, okay? If you would ask me if we're going to have an economic collapse, I would have said, oh yeah, in 1998. 
we're in, ir- in the height of irrational exuberance. But I didn't, but I didn't come public with it until 2007 at Marshall's PDN, where I wrote my paper. And a year later, it happened. So it looked like I had, I had predicted it. But if I had predicted it back in 95 when I believed it was going to happen, or 96, I would have looked like Chicken Little. Mm-hmm. You know? In fact, what am I saying about Chicken Little? Is we're all going to owe Chicken Little an apology. <laughs> when this is over. All right? All right, we're going to owe Chicken Little an apology. This crisis that's coming up is going to take everyone down. It is, because its purpose is to renew its purpose is to dis- is to take away the old structure built on fear, greed. I don't care if it's worked and done all the it's going to go because as Bucky Fuller said, it's this crisis is going to be without precedent. And Bucky said there's two types of action on earth. Class 1, which we induce as creative beings, and class 2, and class 1 that what comes from God. And you know who takes precedence? Class 1. Class one takes precedence. And he said, this crisis is going to be without precedent because its purpose is to rearrange our reality. The purpose is to bring us back to who we are. And we have gotten so far away from who we are, Jeffrey. The, the reason, I, the wonderful reason I was in prison because I enjoyed being where well, I'm, I, I'm not going to say, as some people say, or I don't believe, and it may be true, but I don't believe it, that you cannot have joy and pleasure and love in your life if you want to be enlightened. Not at all. Because those are the gifts of enlightenment. But I will say this. If all you have is joy, pleasure, and love, you're not going to get enlightened. Not in this lifetime. Because we use joy, pleasure, and love to escape from all that other stuff. We run to it out of denial of what's sitting, sitting in front, which is the subject of one of my metaphysical books, Return to Heaven. I mean, The Way to Heaven. All right? Because what I said in that book is, to get back to heaven, you got to retrace your steps on how you left. And all those steps are denial. All those steps is a denial of where we've been, what we've seen, and we have to go through the forgiveness that is required of us to enter the portals of heaven, Jeffrey, is not our forgiveness. We've already been forgiven. It never judged us. We have to forgive. We have to give ourselves. We have to forgive all those people we've judged. We have to take and rewind all our judgments. Uh, we have to do the forgiving. We are already, we were never judged. We were never judged. Our guilt convinced us otherwise. That's why we went like this and started putting on clothes. And that's why when the hippies took acid, they go, let's do it in the road. There's no <laughs> guilt. <laughs> you know, I ran around naked. Yeah. Because that's what, they were freed. Yeah. And then the guilt came back. Yeah. Because drug held at bay through the use of psychedelics did not mean that we had dealt with the root causes of our guilt and mm-hmm. our self-judgment. Mm-hmm. We had, I had to go all the way back and dig up all my own personal things and turn them over and find out that they weren't true, to unjudge myself and others. That's what the process is, is to go through all your own, ju- because we're responsible for our judgments. Each one of us, in this long litany of the fall from grace, we made a lot of judgments, all right? And the, one of the biggest judgments is who we are and who God is. And we have to go back and return. And it's, And I can't say how it is, but I can say this that your desire for it will bring it to you. The mere wish for it will bring it to you. What the Course in Miracles said was this. It it just came to me. This is what it said. Our return to that state is inevitable of oneness because we still are as we were. Okay? So it's inevitable. But what it said was this, Jeffrey. This is why it said it's inevitable. There's only so much pain you can take that is the deal, Jeffrey. In the Course in Miracles, it said, there's only so much pain you can take. And at a certain point, the dissociated self from its soul, the dissociated being from creation will cry out and go, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be another way. And just saying that, just getting to that point, which I tell you, takes guns, cancer, desperation for the ego mind to let go, there's got to be a better way. If it takes that, so be it. 
If it takes that, bless the process. If it takes less, so be it. There's no judgment on what it takes. And the harder you are, the harder the lesson is. It's not there to punish us. Life is not here to punish us. It's just getting there so we will go, there's got to be a better way. And if you've got a good and you're deep in illusion of this is it, of running away, that's all temporary. And that's why the path back is often replete with suffering. Not that we're supposed to suffer. Not that God wants us to get to our knees and cry and ask for help. Not that the universe wants us to be in that state. But because of where, how far we've come through, of the illusions and the thoughts that we've, and the judgments that we've made, that's just the step back. And, and the path itself is, is just full of love. It's just one of love, and, and, and they don't bring you back all at once. They give you little steps, and you work on this, and you get on that, and you go, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Like, oh, we know, we know, we know. But you got to do it. I don't want to do We don't want to do it. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. No, you're not going to die. I know it feels like you're going to die, but we know who you are. You're eternal. I'm going to die. No, you're not going to die. Calm down. See the light. Let the love. I'm going to die. You're going to kill me. No, no, no. Oh, man, this is great. <laughs> Daryl Robert Schoon, I am so glad to be with you again in Albuquerque. I'm thrilled that we're going to do a number of additional interviews. This is coming from your heart to my heart. Bless you, my friend. Namaste. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.